Thank you for coming to another Mars Best Practices event. Um, our Best Practices series focuses on um, specific topics in entrepreneurship. It takes a deep dive into those topics, so it gives you an hour and a half to explore it, one hour for the presentation, and then a half an hour for Q&A. Today, we're talking about something that's extremely important, um, not just to startups and to entrepreneurs, but to just about anybody who sends email, anybody who um, whose focus is on communication in some way, shape, or form. We're talking about compliance with regard to the anti-spamming legislation, which gets going, I think, July 1st is the date. And we have, um, we have Andrew Sprague and... Karen Durrell from Miller Thompson LLP, which is a service provider. They've been a service provider of Mars for about four years now, I think, um, and they've been very generous, and they were very adamant that they do this talk um, sooner than later, which we're very grateful for because we've been hearing more and more about it. And so they're gonna speak to you today about Canada's new anti-spamming legislation and how it affects your startup, how it affects all of us, really. Just to give you a bit of background on both of them, Karen's practice with Miller Thompson focuses on the development of tailored legal strategies for public and private innovators. In particular, she advises public and private sector technology organizations with respect to their unique issues relating to IP procurement as well as intellectual asset management. In doing so, Karen draws on her background in technology and law, which includes a prior career in the information technology sector and several years practicing corporate commercial law. Additionally, she advises clients on policies and regulations that affect their innovations and relate to their IP use, including adherence to privacy, anti-spam, and other re relevant regulations. Andrew, while his practice includes a full range of business, information technology, and intellectual property law matters, has developed an expertise in the information technology area. Andrew advises individuals as well as small, medium-sized, and large companies in the private sector and various government ministries and institutions in the public sector. Andrew is also one of two co-authors of the e-commerce chapter in Business Laws of Canada, published by West at Thomson Reuters Business, and one of three co-authors of the Canada's anti-spamming legislation. Since 2008, Andrew has been writing about Canada's efforts to implement anti-spam laws and has organized and chaired several programs on CASL, including programs involving representatives from both Industry Canada and the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission. This bio, these bios are very brief. They don't do justice to what both Karen and Andrew have done, but I will allow them to get going um, because they're the focus of the event. So please join me in welcoming them to the podium. So good afternoon, and thank you very much for having us here. As was mentioned, we were quite adamant about trying to get in as soon as possible. And the reasons for that will become quite obvious as we go through our presentation. Um, as a first comment, I'd like to just say, you may be looking at the title, and I will move to our title, um, and thinking to yourself, I think I've heard about anti-spam legislation a few years ago. Why are they back talking about it? Why are they saying they need to talk about it right away? And the reason for that is that, yes, the topic came up a number of years ago and was discussed, what are we going to do in Canada to try and prevent spam, which was clogging up everybody's inboxes and causing all kinds of problems. Um, but it isn't until very recently that the decision was made, what are we going to do about it? And that's what we're here to talk to you about today. And the reason we wanted to come so soon is because not only has the decision been made very recently about what the legislation would entail, but on the heels of that decision, it has, the legislation will actually come into effect on July 1st, 2014. So now that they've decided what needs to be done to be compliant with anti-spam laws in Canada, they've also said you need to be compliant by July 1st, 2014. So it's very, very tight frame of time that we have to A, learn what does Canada want us to be doing to um, act within their anti-spam laws that have just come out, and B, to actually get all of those policies and procedures and processes that we're going to talk about today in place. So we wanted to be out talking to groups like you as soon as possible so that you have the longest period of time available to get yourself ready and to talk to, I know some of you work with clients, 
um, who are emerging businesses or other in other industries and to get the news out to them as well about the fact that it's it's coming it's pretty much almost here, the date when we have to actually be acting in accordance with the law. So I just give that as, as a background as to why this is a, a hot topic now, even though it was a hot topic several years ago, so it's a hot topic again, um, but also why um, you need to be thinking about it and concerned about it and getting yourself compliant as soon as possible. Um, because as we say, the, the clock is ticking and you have until July 1st to be compliant. So when we think of an anti-spam law, we think of spam. We think of the people who send out large numbers of messages, and generally we think of, of email messages as being uh, the, the real focus of spam. We, send, we think of these people who send them out and, as I say, clog up our email boxes. And that in, indeed is where the conversation began about what is Canada going to do about this particular situation. But since then, actually the legislation has grown and what we have now on the table in front of us that we need to be compliant with covers a lot of things other than just what we would think of as spam. So this slide is set up just to give you an idea and I'm actually gonna read the slide, which normally I wouldn't do, but I just want to make sure that each of these points is driven home so that you are aware of the scope of this legislation and then that's way beyond just what we think of as our spam problem. So the legislation that is coming into effect on July 1st will regulate the sending of commercial electronic messages, and that doesn't just include emails. It will include emails, text, image messages, sound messages, and voice messages. So we're not just talking about emails today when we talk about um, commercial electronic messages. The altering of transmission data in an electronic message is also covered by this legislation. Engaging in fraudulent or misleading practices through electronic messages or website, also covered in this legislation. Installing computer programs without express consent. Automated collection of electronic addresses, otherwise known commonly as email harvesting, covered under this act. And unauthorized use of computers to collect personal information is also part of this legislation. So as you can see, it's much, much broader than just the topic of emails. And I know the topic of emails is probably what has made the most sort of buzz out there in the media, but please be aware that this legislation does go beyond that. Um, not all of these um, aspects of the act actually come into force on July 1st. The portion of the act that is pointed directly to commercial electronic messages is what comes into effect on July 1st of this year. On January 15th of next year, the installation of computer program provisions will come into effect. And on July 1st, 2017, the private right of action that is part of this act as well will come into effect. And that really deals with class, law, um, class action lawsuits, which is also a potential fallout if you are uncompliant with this act. Um, so just we wanted to give you a, a, an idea that this is not just about emails, but we are going to start by talking about emails in our presentation. Because as I say, that's the part that comes up first. I shouldn't say emails, I keep doing it too. I mean co commercial electronic messages which are more than just emails. So the anti-spam provisions that come into play on July 1st of this year are focused on commercial electronic messages and the fact that it is going to be um, an offense and, and prohibited to send a commercial electronic message to an electronic address unless the intended recipient has consented and also the message contains certain prescribed information. So it's not enough just to have consent and it's not enough just to have the right information in your, in your um, commercial electronic messages. You need to have both. So as you'll notice in this definition that's up here, there's a lot of new, um, or in this segment that's up here, there's a lot of new definitions that are gonna come into play as this act rolls itself out. Um, we're going to look at some of those. For instance, what exactly is a commercial electronic message? You're going to need to know that to make sure you can be compliant. What is commercial for the purposes of commercial electronic messages? And also, what is consent? What constitutes consent? So we're going to discuss these this morning in our, or this afternoon in our presentation. Um, 
And if you have questions as we go along, we're more than happy to answer them if you want some immediate clarification. Otherwise, we will have lots of time at the end for, for questions because from giving these presentations previously, we know that this is a lot of information to be taking in in a short period of time. You have a short period of time to be compliant, so it's important you take it all in. And we end up getting quite a number of questions. So there will be a lot of time for questions at the end. But as I say, we've also found that as we go along, some of this is not intuitive information. And so sometimes clarification can be helpful. We're more than happy to answer clarification questions during the presentation. So don't hesitate to stand up and ask. All right, so um, one thing I want to point out is, as was mentioned, this is not just an emerging business issue, but it's also not just an organization issue. This act actually applies to both individuals and organizations. So it comes down to the individual level as well, which you'll notice as we go along and get into some of the penalties. So there are things that you need to be thinking about as we get ready to get ready for this law. One thing to think about is if you are in touch with organizations in other countries and they're talking about their anti-spam laws, please be aware that what is effective in their countries may not match what's effective in Canada, in part because Canada has decided to put in place legislation that is some of the toughest in the world. So whereas other countries may say, well, we don't need to do that, Canada has decided to be quite strong-armed in the legislation that they have put together. So you need to be compliant if you are acting in Canada with ca Canadian law. So this is, this is what we're going to be presenting to you today. So the first thing you need to think about is, I'm about to send a commercial electronic message. And do I have consent to send that message? That's your absolutely key thing to be thinking about, which means I'm about to send it to a recipient, so I'm going to send a message that has commercial content over to Andrew. Do I actually have Andrew's consent to send him this message? Because I can't send him something that I don't have his consent for. And again, we'll talk about how to get consent and what constitute cons constitutes consent. But this is the first thing to think about under this act. The second thing to think about is, okay, I don't have consent. Can I fall under an exemption? Because there are exemptions set out in the Act for certain instances and certain groups who maybe don't need to get consent to be able to send a commercial electronic message. Andrew's going to address some of those exceptions so that you'll be aware of what they are. Um, but you start from the point of, do I have consent? Because in most cases, you're going to need it. Then we wanted to bring to your attention, why do you need consent or to know if you're under an exemption? And it's because if you do not get consent and you do not fall under an exemption, you could be in the situation where you're going to face penalties for being offside of the law if you send out a commercial electronic message. And the penalties that have been set in this act are quite stiff. Um, you'll notice that they're set up up there. It's different for individuals than it is the pe possible highest penalty for organizations. For an individual, it's a million dollars per violation, not for a group of violations. And for organizations, it's up to $10 million, again, per violation. So it can be quite a heavy penalty that's being laid against those who are non-compliant with the law. So you want to make sure that you do everything that you can to uh, see that you are, under the, you are in compliance with the law. And I just wanted to mention that beyond the monetary penalties, there are some other penalties set out in the Act that you should be aware of. Um, corporate officers, directors, and agents may actually be held personally liable for corporate violations. So if the corporation that you are working with as an officer, director, or an agent is held to be in violation, you could personally be held liable for that violation. There is vicarious liability for corporations that can arise if violations are committed by employees or agents of that organization. So again, it's not necessarily that you have done um, you have sent out a commercial electronic message personally that, that is problematical. Um, it can be that an employee or agent of your corporation has done so and the corporation then becomes um, liable for that activity. Um, I mentioned before, there can be a private right of action which is going to come into play in 2017. And the um, danger of that is really that there could be a risk of a lot of class action lawsuits being raised. And as we all know, the penalties get quite high if you get a lot of people involved in the class. 
There is also a reputational risk for those who are not compliant with the law. Um, can be put out there so everyone's aware of that fact. And also um, want to mention that liability will extend to any person who actually commits, uh, uh, um, sends out a commercial electronic message that is offside of the law, as well as any person who aids in that sending, induces that sending, or procures that sending. So it's not only capturing, again, those who sent. All right, so let's get down to some of the definitions so that we understand better what is a commercial electronic message, what is consent, so on and so forth. So an electronic message in and of itself, as mentioned before, is not just an email. It can be a text message, it can be a sound message, it can be a voice message, it can be an Im image message. This can include emails, texts, social network messaging, um, web forms or portal messaging, instant messaging, and telephone accounts. Keep that in mind as well. So it's not just electronic. Um, if we want to look at what does commercial mean, so how do you know if it's a commercial electronic message on the commercial side of that definition? Commercial refers to anything that encourages participation in commercial activity. So this can be an offer to sell, an offer to lease that's being sent out in the message, um, an offer to provide some kind of business, an offer to provide investment or gaming opportunities. It can be in the message directly, and this is an important point, that, that, that this offer is set or the commercial activity is explained, or the message could include a hyperlink that sends you off somewhere else where that information is included. Even the message that does not have the information written out in it specifically, but, but adds a link that sends you somewhere that gives you that information, that, that message that includes the link will still be considered to be a commercial electronic messages for the purpose of the law. So this is broad. Also, a commercial, um, what will be considered commercial, can be an advertisement of commercial activity. So not, not a straight out offer, but just advertising commercial activity that's available. Or, um, or I shouldn't say or, um, normally you would think that commercial activity also would be something that expects some kind of profit. So I'm offering something to you for sale, you're going to give me some kind of profit back, and that's going to be part of the definition of what it constitutes commercial. In accordance with this new law, there doesn't have to be any expectation of profit for a message to be considered to fall into the world of commercial electronic messages. So it can be outside of the world of profit expectation as well. Okay, so then we need to look at what is consent. How do I know if I got consent before I'm sending out this message after July 1st? Consent can be of two types. It can be express or it can be implied. We're gonna talk about express first and then we're gonna talk about applied. So express consent means that you have actually said to the recipient in advance of sending the message, Andrew, can I send you a message? Andrew has, has given me consent and said, yes, you can. In Canada, to get consent, it has to be opt-in consent, not opt-out consent. And what I mean by that is, Andrew has to say to me, yes, I give you consent. I can't send something to Andrew and say, Andrew, if I don't hear from you, I'm going to just expect that you've consented. I'm going to read that as consent. So that would be opt-out consent, that unless he tells me expressly that he is opting out and not giving consent, I expect that I got consent. That's applicable in some other countries. That will not be applicable in Canada. Canada, I need Andrew to expressly tell me that he is consenting. Opt-in. This is a point that can be a little bit tricky to get your head around, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to explain it, and that's why I didn't start with the first point that's under uh, the definition of consent, and this is, the, this is the point that I wanna make. After July 1st, when this act is in force, if I wanted Andrew's consent, and I sent him an email saying, please give me your consent, that email asking for consent can actually be considered to be a commercial electronic message and to be offside of the law. So keep that in mind too, that when you're thinking about what am I allowed to do and how can I get consent, it is best to get as much consent as you possibly can prior to July 1st, I would put that out there, because activities that involve electronic messages, asking for consent can be considered to be messages that are commercial electronic messages and offside of the law after July 1st, 2014. 
Now, the other type of consent that actually can be, um, can be relied upon for the purposes of this law is implied consent. Implied consent will be considered to exist if you already had an existing non-business relationship or an existing business relationship with the recipient. So Andrew and I have been doing business for the last two years. I've been working with him. We've been messaging back and forth previously. I can rely upon the fact that that relationship is already in existence and after July 1st, 2014, I will be able to still send commercial electronic messages to Andrew as a recipient without getting his express consent previously. Now, there's a hitch to this implied consent, which is this implied consent will only be allowable for up to three years after the act comes into place. So, get express consent from as many of the recipients that you're going to need to be sending commercial electronic messages to as possible before July 1st, 2014. And if you rely upon implied consent for any of your messaging, remember to set yourself a date in your calendar two and a half years from now, telling yourself that you only have six months more before you need consent from all those people. What is a business relationship? Do you have to have sold something or simply communicated with somebody? Um, you have to have communicated with them in a business context. Andrew, do you want to? Oh, sorry. The um, question was, what is considered to be a business relationship? Sure. Hi. The existing business relationship is very similar to the definition of what a, a commercial relationship is. So it's have you um, bought or sold or um, bartered a good or service um, within a two-year period uh, of an individual. So the three years applies when the act comes into force in a transitional provision. After that three-year period, if you, within the last two years before you send that message to somebody, have had a, a business relationship where you've bought or sold um, a good or service, then you would fall under the definition of an existing business relationship. But it's a defined term in the but legislation. You have sold something, not discussed selling something first. Yeah, or if you've made an offer, if you've advertised, it's, it's sort of one of those. Uh, okay, no, but advertised is different. <clears throat> That's right. But if you've advertised, but you've advertised, though, within the law, then you'll be offside of the law, right? Because Karen discussed about if you were to send a message to somebody and you don't have the consent. So if I've already advertised. That's right. That's right. Prior to July 1st, that's right. So anybody I've contacted, to be facetious, anybody I've contacted once before July 1st, I have a business relationship? With? You have an existing business relationship. If you're relying on the transitional provision in the legislation, it's valid for three years. So that would take you to July 1st, 2017. After that period of time, though, you can no longer rely on that implied consent. If you want to rely on an implied consent for an existing business relationship, it then becomes a two-year window period. And so you have to then have, so say we're in 2018, you have to, say January 1st, 2018, prior to January 1st, 2016, you have to have had that existing business relationship that fits within the definition as defined in the legislation. I see a lot of hands for questions. Are these are the clarification questions on this? Yeah. Okay. Um, if, if I understood what what was just being said, um, you often contact people at, at the present time with information, or you might be doing marketing to them. Um, if it was done within the last two years, then they ha then you have an existing business relationship, or there really has to be a, a positive response where they have bought or used services. It sounded like you were just asking, and he got the positive answer, that if I had just touched them, um, you know, I have a lot of clients that we've met at shows, don't have signs, but it's in years, we've been in business 30 years, we have lots of clients yeah. that we touch all the time. So if you've been promoting your goods or services yes. to those individuals prior to July 1st, do you have that three-year exemption? Three to get, to get, to, to get the, sorry? Or if I do it right now. That's right, that's right. And, 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 and I don't want to take Karen's part, but what Karen's going to tell you is um, those implied consents, because there's a time frame, yeah. you're going to want to transition those into an express consent. But if it's okay, if it's clear, I'm going to just pass this back over to Karen. Okay. You have a question? Sure. So let's, I'm going to give you two different cases, but they're not that different. But let's say, you know, Facebook is one where I'm, um, I am, have a profile on Facebook and I post things. Uh, would Facebook consider that to be a business relationship with me? 
uh, that's one thing. The other thing is I've registered, let's say, with the Toronto Star to post comments to some news stories there. Does Toronto Star have a business relationship to, with me? Okay, so I'll address your question is in relation to social media. And if, you know, what instances um, does social media apply? And so the legislation doesn't specifically address the issue. We have had verbal confirmation from the CRTC, who is the regulator for this legislation. And the verbal confirmation that we've had from them is as the follows. An example of Facebook, if you were to post a message to your wall, which is sort of a passive way to put the information out there, and people who are your friends or your contacts through Facebook, then that would not be offside of the legislation. If, however, you're sending a direct message to another Facebook user through their direct messaging feature, then that would now become a, and if it's of a commercial nature, then it's a commercial electronic message and it is caught by the legislation. An additional example is Twitter. People have asked, what happens if you send out a tweet? Is that, if it's a commercial nature, is that a commercial electronic message? And again, the guidance that we've gotten verbally from the regulator is a tweet that's just put out there would not be offside of the law. However, if you were to use Twitter's direct messaging feature to send a message to another Twitter user, and it's commercial in nature, then that would be a commercial electronic message. Now, in terms of the second part of that question related to the Toronto Star, and I guess it's about if you're putting comments onto a, um, uh, you're, you're putting comments in relation to perhaps a news article on a website, Again, that's sort of a passive, you haven't sent a message directly to an, an individual user. If you were to, and I'm not sure if it's possible, if you were to send a, a message to somebody else who had made a comment and it's of a commercial electronic message, then that again would, would um, not be in accordance with the law. But he's volunteer. You have voluntarily gone to the Toronto Star to sign up for that, so they haven't approached you. So the Toronto Star would be on side because you, as the user, have gone to them. Okay. Now, if they take you in your registration process, you provide your email address, and then they subsequently then are sending you messages, and you haven't consented. Then yes, that would put uh, a publisher off side uh, with the requirements. But a user going to a website and registering that doesn't create then that uh, that sort of relationship. We're getting sort of a lot of questions that are sort of like transitioning away. We're going to cover a lot of these things later in our presentation. If it's okay, unless there's something absolutely pressing, could we move on with the presentation? The reason okay. we ask that is we've just found in other presentations we don't get through all the information that we need to give to you. So we just want to make sure we absolutely do that because there is a lot to be covered. But there is a good chunk of time at the end of this to, to take questions. So please do write them down and remember them. We are more than happy to answer your questions. We just want to make sure that also we get the whole of the information about this act because it's quite sweeping, it's quite broad, it's going to have a, a wide effect on, and I'm sure you can see already from the information we've gone through, it's going to have a wide effect and so we, want, we do want to get through our information so we do apologize for this, asking, uh, asking to just continue right through. All right. All right, so let's now talk about, we said that there were two things about commercial electronic messages. First, they have to have consent to be able to send them out, but they also have to have certain information within them to be on the right side of the law. So now we're going to focus on what needs to be in a commercial electronic message in order for it to be compliant with the Act. So a commercial electronic message it needs to include the sender's identifying information. And the point of this is that it can't come out looking like it's come from somebody other than who actually sent it. You need to clearly identify who the sender is so when the recipient gets it, they can recognize who has sent this email to them. It also needs to set out the sender contact information within the message and this contact information has to be valid so that the recipient would be able to contact the sender using that contact information for at least 60 days after the message is sent. This is about trying to make sure that there is real and reliable contact information, that you're not just including an address that um, the, the recipient isn't going to be able to track you down and follow you up afterwards. 
Also, you have to include opt out or unsubscribe options within the, con the um, commercial electronic message that is sent. So you have to get consent before you send it unless you fall under an exception which will be discussed or you have an implied, you're relying upon the replied ex consent for the three years that that's possible. Not only do you have to have, have that happening before you send out the message, but within the message itself, you have to give the recipient yet another chance to tell you, I don't want you sending me messages. So you can have this in an email. It can be a button that they click, that the recipient clips, clicks on. There can be various ways to do it. And I'm sure many of you have received emails that have some kind of opt out or unsubscribe option in them at this point. Um, just remember that anything you do send after July 1st should have that option. And also, if you, somebody who you, your recipient who you send your message to actually does choose that opt out or unsubscribe option, you have the responsibility to act upon that within at least 10 days after the unsubscribed or the opt out it notice is sent to you. So I, again, I send a message to Andrew, Andrew opts out. If I then send another message to Andrew 11 days later, I am offside of the law because I didn't act and make sure that I removed his email and noted that I, or, or however I had electronically messaged to him. I had not noted that I am not to do so anymore because he has opted out of receiving commercial electronic messages from me. So there is an onus on those who are the, the senders to make sure that they keep their information up to date. Also, you can't have your unsubscribe or your opt-out option costing the recipient anything. So um, it has to be a free and clear opt-out option. So I'm going to hand it over to Andrew now, and he's going to discuss some other aspects of the Act itself. Um, but this should give you the basic information that you need to know your deadlines, to know what needs to be in your um, electronic messages, and to know how to get consent. But again, we will take questions on those topics at the end because we do know that they are sometimes as clear as mud. So. That's great. Thank you, Karen. How many of you have your heads spinning right now? I can tell you this is a very common feeling. And um, you likely have a lot of questions, but we're around at the end and we'll try our best to um, give you answers. So Karen has identified for you the consent requirements and as well the informational requirements. But in one of her earlier slides, she mentioned that you may not have to worry about the act if you fit within one of the exemptions. And so what I'm gonna do is share with you now some of the exemptions that apply so that you don't have to worry in some cases about the consent and the information requirements and then in some of the other cases, you don't have to worry about the consent requirements. So there's sort of two categories or two baskets. And so I can give for you the first basket, and this will exempt you from both the consent requirement as well as the informational requirements. And so there's a number of um, types of exemptions that will apply. So the first that applies is a message that an employee or a representative of an organization sends to another employee or representative within the same organization, a message that concerns the activities of an organization. So Karen and I work together at the same law firm, and I send Karen an email uh, that, reflect, that relates to the affairs of our law firm, then that would be exempt from the application of this legislation. Another exemption would be an employee or representative of one organization sending an electronic message to an employee of another organization and the sender of that message who sent the message to somebody in another organization in that email or other type of message it relates to the affairs of the recipient's organization so for an example if i were to send an email to somebody at mars and the email related to the affairs of mars and we um, and our organizations already had had a, a relationship with each other then that message would fall outside of the scope of this legislation. So these are sort of business to business exemptions. Another exemption is if, a message, if you receive a message and you're sending a message in response to a request, an inquiry, or a complaint, or a message is otherwise solicited by somebody who sent the message to you, you are permitted to respond and not have to worry about the consent and informational requirements under the legislation. 
Another exemption applies to if you want to enforce a legal right, a legal obligation, um, a right that arises under the law. Those are those sort of um, electronic messages that relate to that are exempt from the requirements of the legislation. If an inquiry or an application is sent to an individual or an organization that's engaged in a commercial activity, and the message is only an inquiry or an application about the commercial activities, that as well is exempt from the consent and information requirements under the legislation. So when the legislation was uh, in the, in the uh, regulation drafting stage, the regulators went out for public comments. And there were a lot of comments from the Canadian charitable not-for-profit sector because the law as it's drafted applies to them. And they had asked for carve-outs to be exempt. And they were, to get a very, they were able to get a very narrow carve-out. And so if a charity, and it has to be a registered charity under the Income Tax Act, so it does not apply to non-profits. So if a registered charity is sending a message and the primary purpose of the message is the raising of funds, then that is exempt. But if the primary purpose of a message that a charity is sending to perhaps its members, to its donors, to other stakeholders, and the message pertains to the products or services that are offered by the charity, they'd have to comply with the consent and information requirements under the legislation. Would you be surprised if I told you that political parties are exempt? They are exempt for raising of funds for political parties. It applies to candidates, um, parties, and uh, political organizations. Messages are also exempt, and these are defined terms under legislation. They're exempt if there's a personal relationship or a family relationship. And they're, they're narrow definitions, and I would encourage you to look at that definition. But if a message is being sent between people that have a personal relationship, then again, they're exempt from the consent and information requirements under the legislation. So people have asked a question. We talked a little bit earlier during the questions about social media. And so somebody has asked the question, uh, if you're a BlackBerry user, there, there's a feature called BlackBerry Messenger, also known as BBM. And people have asked, if messages are sent by BBM, are those captured? And so the government has created an exemption that if a message is sent and received on an electronic messaging service, provided certain requirements are met, that would be exempt. And so in the example of BlackBerry Messenger, you would have to include the information requirements and the unsubscribe, not in the individual message you're sending, but in a user profile, there's space where a user can type in some of their, their contact info. And so the expectation of the regulator is, if you're using BlackBerry Messenger, rather than having to put all this information in each message you send, if you include it in your contact information, then you would be able to rely on the exemption and not have to worry about the consent and informational requirements. We've got two more exemptions that fall into this category. And again, the category is exempt, exempted from consent and information requirements. The banks were able to convince the government to do an exemption for secure, uh, limited access portals. So for example, if with your bank, if you log in to your bank account to do online banking, that's a secure portal. And you may be familiar with, if you do online banking, that the bank's able to send you messages um, to you. And so the banks, uh, or a, a portal that's structured in that way, those messages that are sent from the provider to a customer through that secure portal, that's exempt from the requirements of the legislation. And finally, the last exemption is what if a message is being sent outside of the country? And so people ask, um, how, what does, how does this law apply? And so the law applies to it's any message sent or received in Canada. And so if, even if though we're perhaps in Canada and we're sending a message and we're sending it outside of Canada, our legislation would apply. However, there's an exemption, and the exemption is if the sender of the message reasonably believes that the, the message is going to be accessed in another country, perhaps the United States, and if that other country that it's being sent to is on a list that's attached to the uh, regulation, it's a list of countries, it includes most of the major countries. I do note, though, that Mexico is not on the list, but United States are, and so are many other Commonwealth countries. If one of those countries is listed on that schedule, and the message you're sending complies with the local laws, then you're exempt. And of course, the challenge we would have as Canadians is how do we know what the local laws are of the jurisdiction it's being sent into? And so this is um, 
the exemptions the exemption is there it's a, in my opinion it's a very difficult one to rely on because you've got to know the the law of where you're going into you got a question yeah how would you know where you're sending it to if it's at you know dot com that's right so you, so you would have to know where the sender is physically located and again it's, uh, the test in here is you reasonably believe the sender will receive it but you're right if you don't know where the sender is then you wouldn't be able to rely on this exemption so this okay. is presuming you know you know where your recipient is but if I send it to people I know we're in the US I can send it from Canada and if you're trying to then I, you know, if I use MailChimp which has an unsubscribe feature which complies with the US regulations yeah so if you want to get yourself outside of this legislation yeah. and not have it apply then you would have to send it to a country that's on the list of countries that are so just don't send it yeah, I mean, that's, that's a challenge. Any messages are sent or received within Canada, the law then applies. Okay. Um, so this has extraterritorial reach, and so this also affects U.S. companies and U.S. individuals who are sending messages into Canada. And a lot of them, uh, like a lot of Canadians, don't realize this law is coming, and as Karen identified for you, coming very quickly. Um, this applies to people throughout the world. So again, that basket that I just gave you was exempted from consent and exempted from the information requirements. So there's another basket. So we'll leave the first basket behind. The second basket, you have to follow the informational requirements. And Karen talked about that. That's identifying who the sender of the message is, providing contact information, providing the unsubscribe. But you don't have to worry about the consent requirement. And so I'm going to give you this basket. So if you're providing a quote or an estimate in response to a request that's been received by, by the recipient, then that's okay. And again, you don't need consent to reply because you've received uh, a, a request, please give me a quote, and you're responding with a quote. The message you send, though, has to relate solely to that. In this basket, I'm giving you the message, the commercial electronic message you're sending has to re relate solely to these. So it can't be this plus something else that you want to add into your message. The message is very, it's a very um, narrowly defined exemption. So the other exemption, it's a message that's sent solely to provide warranty information, product recall, safety or security information to a recipient who has either purchased goods or services from an individual or an organization. Now, if you want to send a message, again, solely for the purpose of facilitating, completing, or confirming a commercial transaction that you've previously agreed to with somebody, that's exempt. But again, it's only exempt from consent. You also have to, you have to include those informational requirements. If you're providing for somebody a product or a service on a subscription basis, then if you're going to be providing factual information about that, that's exempt. And you can see these exemptions are very narrowly defined. Um, and so you've got to really, if you're going to rely on one, really look at the language, suggest look at the language and legislation to ensure that you can rely on that exemption. Two more exemptions under this category. And again, these are messages that solely relate to. And the next one is an employment relationship. And so if you want to send a message to somebody and it relates to an employment relationship, then that would be exempt from getting consent. And the last one is if you want to deliver a good or product or service, perhaps an upgrade or an update to computer software, and the person who you're sending that message to is entitled to receive that uh, upgrade or update or product or service under a previously agreed agreement, then that would be exempt from the legislation as well. So as Karen said, is that clear as mud? There was discussion about what about referrals? And the government decided in the last round of the regulations, which were finalized in December 2013, that there's an exemption for referrals, but it's got to meet certain requirements. So the requirements are, say there's a real estate agent that has just sold a house for somebody, and the person who uh, was the client of real estate agent says, I have somebody else that I want to refer them to you so that you could be their real estate agent. The real estate agent will be permitted to send a one-time only commercial electronic message to the person who was referred, provided that the person who's doing the sending of the message, so in this case the real estate agent, 
has an existing business relationship, an existing non-business relationship, a personal relationship, or a family relationship, so one of those four, with both the person who made the referral and the person who's the target of the referral. And I, I see some smiles. It's you know, there's a there's a lot of rules here. Yeah. And so to do the referral, if you're making the referral and you say you do fit within those definitions, you have to provide the full name of the person who provided the referral. And you have to say that the message you sent is a result of that referral as well. And so it's sort of a full disclosure that I'm emailing you out of the blue, but I'm doing so because this person uh, over here has told me that, um, that, uh, that you could make that referral. So, so those are those are your exemptions under legislation. I'm going to move now because Karen, remember, if you talked at the beginning about this legislation is called Canada's anti-spam legislation, and yet, as you saw from one of Karen's earlier slides, this covers a lot more than just um, spam emails or commercial electronic messages. It includes other items. So, I'm going to move into those other items for us. So, the first one is alteration of transmission data. And so this prohibition is to ensure that electronic messages are not sent or copied somewhere other than where the message sender believes the message is going. And so this is somebody changing the routing information in a message. So that if I'm sending a message, um, somebody intercepts it and then routes it away from my intended sender and it ends up going somewhere else. So under the legislation, no person can alter those messages um, um, to send it to somebody other than the intended recipient, the person who sent it intended it to go to. There is an exemption, and the exemption applies to telecommunication companies that are doing the rerouting as part of their network management. But this was, I guess, a concern for our government, and so that's why there's this prohibition on altering transmission data. Our government has also decided now to target spyware, malware, and other malicious software. And this legislation's computer program provisions apply if a computer system is located in Canada, that's one criteria, or if the person who uh, is installing a computer program is in Canada but the computer is located in another country or another jurisdiction, or if a person in another jurisdiction is installing software on a computer in another jurisdiction but they're acting under the direction of somebody in Canada, then these provisions kick in. So under these provisions, um, no person, and again, person in the legislation is an individual, an organization, any sort of legal entity, can't in the course of a commercial activity, and again, Karen talked earlier about what a commercial activity is, they can't install or cause to be installed a computer program onto another person's computer system and the definition of computer program and computer software actually come from our criminal code. And so they've incorporated by reference those two defined terms, and I can tell you they're very broadly defined. And I think they, uh, what people might not think is a computer program is going to be caught by this. And so uh, very broad. And so if you're installing or caused to be installed that computer program on another person's software, or if you're using a program to cause an electronic message to be sent, from another computer system, you have to have express consent of either the owner of the computer or the authorized user. So we can take away from this, implied consents don't apply. It has to be an express consent to install a computer program. And so where this would not apply, you're familiar with the idea of um, web wrap agreements. And what that is, if say if you're on the internet and you go to a website and you want to download a piece of software and they have a link perhaps that says um, our terms and conditions are here, but you don't have to click I agree to those terms, but they just post a notice saying these are where they are, you should read them, but there's no affirmative action required on you before you can download, that wouldn't meet the test under here for express consent. Now if, however, on the other 
hand it something called like a click wrap agreement. And what that is, is you have to click a box that says, I agree. And then you're able to proceed further after you've read the terms. Then that sort of uh, agreement would be an express consent under the legislation. Computer programs under the legislation would apply to apps, updates, servers, personal computers, smartphones, tablets, ebook readers, websites, web services. It's very, very broad. So there isn't a deemed express consent for programs such as cookies, HTML code, JavaScript, or operating systems, provided that it's reasonable for the person who consented to the installation um, um, believe that that's what it was, and also in accordance with guidance from the Industry Canada. If the program does not include executable code or is able to carry a virus or the ability to install any sort of malware. And so if it, if it doesn't meet that threshold, then you wouldn't have the deemed express consent. And for the express consent, it's very similar as Karen discussed for the commercial electronic messages. You have to disclose what the purpose is of why you're getting that consent. You have to provide the identifying information. And so for all software, all computer programs, in addition to getting the consent and doing the informational disclosures, you also have to, under the legislation, clearly and simply describe in general terms the function and purpose of the computer program that is going to be installed. And these consents have to be separate and apart from the consents you're going to get perhaps for commercial electronic messages, for consents you might get for altering transmission data. They have to be separate and distinct consents. They can't be bundled. They can't also be bundled, for example, in the case of software, they can't be bundled with an end user license agreement. And so software uh, producers are going to have now in their software have two forms of consent. It's one, I consent to the end user license agreement, and then there needs to be then an anti Castle Canada's anti-spam legislation consent saying I consent to the installation of this software and again it needs to be that affirmative um, consent checking a box um, and then saying I agree but now it gets a bit more complicated and this is where I'm going to answer your the questions that have been asked the legislation has put in it some functions and you can see them on the slide here on the bottom and so if a computer program meets any of those specified functions, in addition to getting the consent, in addition to the informational requirements, and again, separate and apart from a license agreement, you have to clearly and prominently display, uh, or describe rather, the computer program's material elements that perform one of the functions that's listed here, including the nature and scope of those elements, and the reasonable foreseeable impact on the operating system of the computer program. And the government's approach is they want full disclosure for consumers to know if one of these functions is going to happen, that the consumer would know what the impact will be on their software, uh, on, their, on their operating system or on their computer or other device. And so you can see here collecting personal information. So if you have an app that, uh, that collects personal information, you have to give this disclosure and you have to have express consent How do you define PEII? Personal, personally identifiable. Uh, I think there's. Um, I think there's another another regulation or legislation that defines what personal identifiable information is that you use. So, so yeah, so this legislation uses the definition of personal information, and it takes that definition from uh, Canada's federal privacy legislation. It's known as PIPEDA. It's the Personal Information um, Protection Electronic Documents Act. And so the, the phrase there is personal information. I don't, I'm not familiar with the, the PII. I'm talking about the, PII is an acronym, actually. But it refers to the PIPEDA legislation. Okay. So in, in this legislation, they're using personal information, and they're taking the definition from the federal privacy legislation. And so if, and I'll read these out, if, if the software program collects personal information, if it interferes with the control of a computer, if it changes or interferes with the settings, preferences, or commands, of a device that if it obstructs, interrupts, or interferes with access to or use of data of somebody's device, 
if it causes a the computer system to communicate with another computer system without any authorization. If you're installing a computer program that can be activated by a third party, and that's I mean, for cases of uh, malware, where somebody can go into a computer through perhaps a back door in, in the software. And so if you meet, if, you're, if a software program has any of these functions, you have to get the full disclosure or give full disclosure to a user and get their express consent. And for th these functions that are listed that I've just read to you, the acknowledgement has to be in writing. And so, in writing means either clicking, you know, checking a box, I agree, and then clicking I agree, and then tracking that in a log, um, perhaps either on an internet site or the computer program then relays that back to the manufacturer. But there has to be a way to track the consumer has actually given their affirmative consent. And you also have to put a statement that they understand and agree that the computer um, program performs any of these specified functions that you've identified. And so it's really about full disclosure and the consumer uh, acknowledging that they've received the full disclosure. So the question comes, what about upgrades and updates to software? Because once you've installed software, you may be entitled to an upgrade, an update, a patch to the software if there becomes a problem with it. So the legislation says that if you haven't got consent in your original consent that you asked to install the program to do to later install an update, an upgrade, a patch, you have to go back and get consent. And so the advice we give people is in the first instance, when you're getting the consent to install the software, get the consents also for the upgrades, the updates, the patches. So that's the fun stuff with computer programs. It's going to change the way that um, Canadians are able to uh, deal with software, and it's really going to affect a lot of companies that are bringing out apps. Apps are very popular these days. Uh, apps being applications, for those who don't know, and smartphones um, are driven these days by applications, and so this is going to fundamentally change the way that main, um, developers and manufacturers of apps can provide those to consumers. Some other changes, and these actually have already been made, and Karen talked about July 1st of this year, 2014, for the commercial electronic messages. The provisions relating to computer programs that I've just described to you, that starts January 15th, 2015. So we have, a, you know, we have about a half a year to become compliant with the computer program provisions. But these next provisions I'm going to tell you about are already in force. They came in force in 2012. So the first additional change that this legislation has made is it's amended our Competition Act. And now our Competition Act prohibits false or misleading representations in either the sender description of an e of a electronic message, in the subject matter field, in the me or the message field in the electronic message. It's now also prohibiting false or misleading representations in a URL or other link or other locator that's in a electronic message. So as Karen described earlier, you click on a link, it takes you perhaps to a website. If on that website there's false or misleading statements, you're now subject to penalties under both the Competition Act as well as the stiff penalties that Karen described to earlier under this piece of legislation. And so companies need to be aware that if they're making any sort of statements in, in promoting their goods or services, that they've got to be uh, true, they can't be misleading, I'll give you an example, if an established company says this is our greatest sale ever and somebody were to dig back through previous advertising materials and you could prove that no, this was not the greatest sale ever because they had that greatest sale ever five years ago, that's misleading, uh, it's a misleading misrepresentation and will be subject then to uh, the anti-spam legislation as well as the Competition Act. And so this legislation also amended Canada's federal privacy law. The acronym is PIPEDA. I described earlier it's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. And it amends it in a number of ways. So the first way it amends it to prohibit the use of a computer program to automatically collect uh, electronic addresses. And this is commonly known as something as email harvesting. And so it's through automated means trolling through the internet, collecting people's email addresses to build a nice contact list that perhaps um, 
people then make available for sale that you can buy a um, you know a long list of people's email addresses that have been taken from searching over the internet. So that is now unlawful. What makes this even more complicated, particularly for individu individuals and organizations that already have contact lists, if you use one of those email addresses that have been unlawfully collected through automated means, you're now subject to the act and it's a prohibition to use an email address that has been unlawfully collected. And so the challenge for individual organizations is going to be to figure out where do they get their email addresses from. Um, and if it was through an automated means, they've got to then examine, do they have the lawful right to use that um, electronic address? The other change under our federal privacy legislation relates to somebody accessing someone else's computer without authority and collecting personal information off of that. So perhaps uh, this is a case of a hacker hacking into uh, um, somebody's computer, taking their personal information. That's unlawful. And what also is unlawful is if you use that personal information, and again, organizations and individuals need to examine then where do they get their personal information from? Because to use that personal information that's been unlawfully collected would put you offside of this legislation as well. So I'm going to uh, pass this back to my colleague. And I'm sure your heads are spinning more than when I got up here. And I uh, apologize for that. Uh, you can see this is a very complex and complicated piece of legislation with a lot of changes. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to Karen. Okay, so we just have one last message to leave you with, which is July 1st, 2014 is soon. So we would highly suggest that you start preparing now. Um, we also have mentioned up here a newsletter that was put together by our firm, which gives some tips about ways to start getting processes, procedures, audits, various activities happening so that you can get yourself in a position where you're going to be able to be compliant by July 1st. Um, so we would encourage you to go take a look at that and that will just help you get yourself prepared. And now, as we promised, we're leaving as much time as possible for questions. So anyone who has a question, run on up to a mic and we're more than happy to answer. We're just asking you to go to the mic so that it's mic'd for the presentation. So I have two sort of review questions and a question. So I can send for the next three years to anybody that I've sent one email to before July 1st. As long as that email that you was sent was of a business nature and created a business relationship between yourself what and the What if I just sent recipient? them an ad? Yeah, so, so an, ad not, for a an ad for a business commercial activity? Commercial activity. Then that should okay. be covered. Yes, you have three so, years. So I can also send to an American or anybody else who's not a Canadian as long as I follow the rules of that country. So in the States, all it says is you have to have opt out and identify yourself. Basically, if you use MailChimp or some commercial thing, you're clean. So as long as I know I'm sending to a non-Canadian and I conform with the rules of that country, I'm okay. Then you could rely, you could, you could rely on the exemption yeah. that yeah. apply. Yeah. So, so I just have a further one. Uh, what if I have an American employee and let's make it somebody I control? You know, so, it's, <laughs> okay. so, so not just an, so what if I hire an American uh, and they send it to non-Canadians? I'm completely clear of the act. They're sending it from the from US. The US they're ISP. positioned in the US. Yeah, they're 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 an American using an American ISP, and they're 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 sending a, it to non-Canadians. But are you promoting goods or services in Canada? I don't know what a good or service is in Canada. It would be delivered to an American. But where's it, it being? Where, where's it being? Canada? Where's it being delivered from? Where's the where's the business base from? That's being talked about in the email. I could have a trip from Buffalo, but I mean, let's say it's from Canada. Then you would. The, the, you would be caught by the legislation. Okay, but I'm clear if I'm sending it to Americans anyway, so I'm not clear because per, of the per, Americans sending to Americans, but as a Canadian sending to Americans, I'd be okay. Because there's also under the legislation, and Karen talked about this, if you're procuring, inducing, yeah. um, you know, and you could be caught under that as well, um, and sort of using a, trying to use a third party in another jurisdiction when in fact it really is something that's taking but place I'm in Canada. I'm clear of the act on if you're fall if you fit within the definition yeah, of what yeah, those yeah. requirements are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
to our understanding of the way that the act is drafted at this I point, yes. You. I understand your lawyer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, now that I know what to do and what I can do, that's good. But, I mean, these laws are a bit complex. Um, mm -hmm. The fines seem a little bit excessive, like $1 million per violation. I'm guessing initially, I mean, uh, there will be some flexibility, or I mean, it just says the law, or I mean, that's a, I guess this is an arbitrary question. Also, I guess anybody who actually wants to go after you for like a million dollars, they would actually have to get a lawyer and go through a process first, right? No, so I'll explain a few things. So I'll give you some more background. Our federal government through the CRTC has set up something called the Spam Reporting Center. It's already been built, it's already ready to go. They have investigators waiting for July 1st. Well, I think they're waiting until July 2nd because July 1st is Canada Day and national holidays. So my, my suspicion is the law comes in force July 1st, but I suspect enforcement starts July 2nd. So they are prepared to go out. They're doing two things. They're taking complaints from the public and they're also doing their own investigations. They've got investigators, they've got labs set up to um, go after people who are offending this piece of legislation. So the question then arises, as you've raised, what is the enforcement approach that they're taking? And the answer is we don't know. We don't know if they're going to um, come out very strict on July 2nd, or if they're going to give people a transition period. We just don't have any guidance on that. And so the most prudent advice we give to people is be very careful and ensure that you're in full compliance, because until we start seeing cases coming out of the CRTC and decisions being rendered, we just don't know how it's going to be interpreted. We, we can say though that there has been a lot of feedback asking for changes to the law and so far there has been no sort of give on those uh, requests. So the law is as the law is. Like I, it doesn't sound like too horrible, but like I mean, I would assume there's probably one or two warnings for this. Yeah, we, we, we yeah, can't we say. Don't. Yeah, what, what I can tell you, and you know, you raised the issue of if somebody has a complaint, do they have to hire a lawyer? And the way actually the penalties are set up, it's an administrative monetary penalty. So it's not, it's not from a civil action. And as Karen described, the, the right to sue somebody civilly doesn't arise until July 1st, 2017. So there's a three year hold period until that comes into force. The administrative monetary penalties of the 1 million for individuals and the 10 million for organizations, that's imposed by the CRTC. And I can tell you that those administrative monetary penalties are the stiffest of any AMPs. They're known as AMPs. AMPs are the stiffest of any administrative monetary penalties of any Canadian legislation. And so this is by far the, the most strict legislation that has come into force um, through our government. I can tell you, though, that not everybody will likely be subject to the, the maximum, the maximum of 1 million, the maximum of 10 million. There's a number of factors which are set out in the legislation the government will take into consideration when deciding what, what should the penalty be. They'll look at are you a first time offender? They'll look at sort of the, the circumstances and the nature behind what has happened. You know, was it inadvertent? Did the organization, say it comes from an organization, did the organization take prudent steps in advance to prepare for the legislation? Did it put in place policies, procedures? Did it train its employees on the legislation? Did it, did it, did it do the things to help itself be on side, and the government will take those into, it has told us, they will take those into consideration. If an organization has done nothing and they've said, we'll just wait till July 1st and we'll take our chances, that's not going to help as much for an organization who, in the legislation, organizations are able to rely on something called a due diligence defense. And that defense is basically saying, we took steps to prepare, we took steps to get ready, and those will help be, those will help be mitigating factors and, but again, what those penalties will be, will only time will tell once we see decisions coming out of the CRTC on their enforcement side, you know, the approach that they're taking. I wish we could have more guidance for you, but we don't. One thing I do want to mention, though, is that we have been calling it the Canada Anti-Spam Law. You'll see that generally out there the media is calling it the Canada Anti-Spam Law. That's not the actual name of the law, though. So if you are going to look to see, I want to see firsthand what are the definitions. It's a much longer name, so just be aware of that in case that was something somebody was going to do. We'll take another question. Okay. Um, so you were talking about uh, harvesting. Does that mean after July 1st you can't purchase lists online anymore? Actually, those provisions came in force in 2012, so they're actually already in place. And so if okay. you're purchasing lists from third parties, I would have them give you an indemnity 
that basically says how they've like have them describe to you how they've collected their email addresses. Okay. And if they've done something that's offside with the law, have them identify you for if you get sued because you use something that they provided to you, have them basically make you whole through a legal agreement. But you've got to be very careful now if you're buying third party lists because you've got to trace where those came from. Because really they're supposed to be getting people to opt in before they can provide yeah. me. And with it. third party providers, you have no idea where their lists are coming from. Oh, so okay. uh, you've got to be very careful. Okay. Um, and then my next question is, uh, what about an invitation to an event? Can I send someone an invitation if we're having something? Your, your, your event is promoting a service. Yes. So then that would be a commercial electronic message. So okay. you, yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so what about the names you get at a booth when you go to a conference? Like, are they implicit? Like, what is? Yeah, so there's two additional implied consents that you can rely on. The legislation talks about um, uh, an electronic address that has been published, and they say conspicuously published. And so presumably on a business card, somebody has put their email address. So it's like you go and you scan them, and then? So provided they haven't put on their business card, I don't want to receive commercial electronic messages. And provided that you're emailing them in relation to their business, so it isn't promoting your own business, you're emailing in respect of their organization. And provided you've, in your fishbowl, if you're at a conference or at a booth somewhere, have put a notice of what the purposes are that you're going to be using that, then you would be okay. <laughs> but you can see there's, there's, there's a lot of steps you would have to follow. So the simple, Collecting business cards in a fishbowl without sort of fitting within these requirements would now be offside under this legislation. Okay. The other implied consent is if somebody's like the conspicuously published, so I've published here my email address on the slide, you don't see a note that says don't send me commercial electronic messages. So you would now be permitted to send me a message if it related to the affairs of my organization. Now I can tell you all, you all have my express consent to, to email me if you wish, but this would be another implied consent that you could rely on. That if you see somebody's email address on a website without a notice saying don't email me, and the email relates to their affairs, not to yours, then you'd be able to rely on an implied consent. Okay, but it has to relate to their affairs. That's correct. So, so let me just step back because I have three questions now. I go to a trade show and I get a business card from someone. I'm at a trade show, I'm selling something, they gave me a business card. Is there an implied consent for me to contact them back? If they have not told you no. Okay. No, again, what I, I would be What if I scan their badge, which is just another version of taking, you know, you know where they have a electronic badge scanners. Again, can I scan your badge? It's a trick, it's, 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 that's a tricky question. And, I, and again, we're hearing a lot about sort of, this is really gonna impact conference organizers because of a lot of things they're doing with technology to make it easier for people to network with each other. A lot of these, like I don't have the answer to that if you're scanning somebody's badge, because presumably then it's a, it's a QR code or some other yeah. sort of coding that then provides that. I'd have to give that more sort of uh, but, but thought. But they were aware of it. They were, I, I, didn't, it, I didn't surreptitiously scan their badge. But then it, if but, you've ever tried to do it, it usually takes. <laughs> yeah, but then the question comes, did the conference planner then get the appropriate consents? And did those consents that they got then apply to all the delegates at that conference? And so again, it's, it's, it's not, unfortunately these questions, there's no black and white answer. There's a lot of gray. And it, and it comes to how things have been set up to then be able to sort of give an analysis. And I'll have done it in the United States, so it's <laughs> so So just, just to clarify, I can contact you based on you publishing your email or me going to the Miller Thompson website and finding your email about Miller Thompson services, but I can't contact you about my services. That's correct. And okay. so but what doesn't prevent you, though, is when we had older technology of a telephone, picking up the phone and calling me, or if we want to go even further back in technology, sending a letter or something through the posting system, through, through Canada Post. But the legislation doesn't apply to facts. It does not apply to facts, that's correct. That or faxes as well. We were going back to the days of faxes. Yes, bringing back faxes. <laughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to get a bit more clarity on charity versus nonprofit, and just want to find out if nonprofit is, those are totally out, and charities are the only one with the exemption for 
or asking for donations, I think you said. Yeah, yeah. so the exemption replies, uh, relates to the raising of funds is, is the phrase that they've used. It applies only to registered charities under the Income Tax Act. And so nonprofits have, have not been included in that exemption. Yeah, everything else would apply. So if the electronic message, its primary purpose is the raising of funds, then it's okay. But if the primary purpose is something else, okay. then it then you would need to comply with the legislation. Thanks. Right. This was a follow-up question to the very first question you asked in this session about um, um, a mailing to the U.S. Um, to offer services. You're a Canadian company, but you're offering services to the U.S. companies, and you're competing with U.S. companies. Um, are you under U.S. law? Or because it's a, you're, you're a Canadian company, you're offering services and competing with U.S. So your, your um, message to the U.S. has to be in compliance with U.S. Um, anti-spam law. Even, even though we're Canadian-based and our service comes out of Canada. Yes. Well, so that's, if, that, that's if you're going to be relying on that exemption, and it's a very yeah. tricky exemption because there's a lot of requirements you've got to make sure you comply with. And so I don't. I just wanted to guess, clarify everybody. It isn't about if you're in the U.S. You're totally out of this. You're not. If you're if you're in Canada and you're sending messages from Canada, mm -hmm. then you are caught by the legislation. So it's messages sent into Canada and messages received in Canada. No, but sent from Canada to a Florida company that we deal with in Florida. Yes. Right, so you're not outside of the law, but you might fit in within the exemption under the Canadian law, which says that you still have to be compliant with the US, US anti-spam yes. laws. Okay. But you need to be careful about that. That's not a blanket um, exemption that you can just easily fit under. There are, there are several aspects to it, and you need to make sure you fit under those aspects if you're going to rely upon it, is what we're saying. So you want to carefully consider what you're doing and what all of those aspects are to make sure that you are compliant and that you are actually falling under that exemption. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of easy advice to be giving about this. It really does depend on what you're doing and in what you're doing. This is why we're saying start now to get yourself prepared because it's going to involve quite a number of different processes and different procedures for different types of companies who have different electronic messaging and different computer program needs and requirements. And so you're going to have to look at yourself, at, at your organization and say, what do we do? What are our messaging requirements? What are our computer program requirements? And you're going to have to really intensely look at that and then be able to say, okay, now that we know what our needs are, how do our needs reflect with the law and what do we need to do to make sure that we are either under an exemption or we are compliant with the uh, other portions of the law. So unfortunately, we can't kind of give quick fix answers. Good. Um, I don't know if that means I shouldn't ask my question. No, 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 by all means. <laughs> you can ask any question. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, I mentioned before that we make an app and uh, that app is installed on people's phones by the app store. So we don't do that. Um, so thus, I assume we don't need to be the ones getting consent. Them clicking the button, installing, is them giving consent? It's a tricky question because you're using a third-party provider, I guess, to, to supply that app. Mm -hmm. But if it's your app that's collecting, for example, I think your question earlier was about it's collecting personal information or it's pulling people's contacts right. from. So now you, you would need to get those consents because it's you're operating that computer program, you're the one who's collecting that information. Yeah. So those consents would be, need to be obtained by you, not by that third party. Right. Um, so if, uh, I know you said that we can't get all of our consents in one page. So first we have our terms of service come up, and but then we would have to have additional pages saying, we also want to email you, and we also want to know whether we can pull in your contacts. That's right. So all these consents have to be separated from each other and have okay. to be d distinct. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm in the very early stage of business startup for profit, so I'm not exempt by the charity part. I don't have any existing relationship, commercial relationship. I don't want to rely just on people that I have personal or family relationship because the product may or may not be suitable for them. And if I send out a message asking for consent, that's considered as <laughs> commercial electronic message. So how can I obtain, and buying a list is not a viable method. So how can I even obtain a way to complete my market research 
because it, to do my, the ultimate objective of my market research is to understand the customer's need, the target customer needs, in order to really check my product to them. Yeah, it's going to change the way that businesses are um, getting the news out about themselves to people who then can contact them back and and move facts. forward. So yeah, right. we've you know we've talked about the fact that mail's okay. We've talked about the fact, although mail prices just went up, um, we've talked about the fact that fax is still okay. Um, face to face <laughs> contact to get written consent is okay. Phone calls, um, phone calls are okay. Um, we had an interesting idea brought up at another session we were at, which may or may not work, which is getting your, making sure that your information gets published, whether in a article, so that people could contact you. Um, you know, it's going to change the way that we do things, undoubtedly. But we're, we're not sure exactly how it's going to change it yet. But at this point, up to July 1st, you're still okay. So, so meaning that, that, hurry up to get as many contacts yeah. as possible. Yeah. <laughs> send, everybody <in> <laughs> send everybody in LinkedIn, whatever, one message, everybody in Facebook, and stand in whatever Union Station and distribute. <laughs> My God. Yeah, and, and one, of the, one of the things we want to say is, is, I think this has been evident from the comments we've been making, which is that this is new, this is going to change things, and we're going to need to not only know how to be compliant for July 1st, but we're going to have to keep our ear to the ground to hear the decisions that are made as people fall, as, as this law comes into force and people and organizations feel those growing pains. There may be, you know, flow through that happens from that. As, as Andrew had said, um, sometimes when the regulators have been asked certain questions recently, there aren't firm answers yet. We are going to be seeing those answers coming out over time. So definitely take away from this what you need to do for July 1st, but also keep your ear to the ground for what, what happens as a fallout from this as it comes into force and as it plays out in society. So I'm going to give you guys a website to check out if you've got a pen and paper, get it ready, or if you've got a device you want to type in. It's um, the federal government has set up a website to help individuals and organizations figure out this law and figure out how to be compliant. So it's a really easy URL. It's fightspam.gc.ca. So w one of my concerns is that what I've heard you say is that some, or some government organization is going to be listening to all our emails. Uh, have they published how they're going to, on their end, protect that information? Uh, I don't believe that's said in the Act, and I, I'm not sure. I have to look at sort of what the legislation says about they've been given sort of broad powers. They have uh, the ability to execute search warrants, to collect data. Um, and so it isn't sort of like eavesdropping, that sort of stuff. But if they are being tipped off about something's going on or if they're sort of hearing rumblings, then they have the powers to go and then do those investigations. But I don't think this is a matter of our government sort of snooping in on everybody. So I misheard, I misheard earlier the, the process that they're going to use. Uh, it, the process that they're going to use is by relying on um, uh, inf information that they receive from third parties. That and then as well their own, their own investigations and how they're conducting those. I mean, I don't have the absolute clarity. I can tell you the legislation sets out what their legal rights and powers are to conduct those investigations, but operationally how they're doing them, I mean, I can't comment on that. Another question? Uh, I've got two. One sort of a yes, no. Um, so for email signatures, sometimes we'll have a banner saying, like, register for this conference that's coming up. If you're responding to someone's direct request for information about something, if the body of your text has the response to their request, but your signature has that link to the invite, does that count as a commercial message? Um. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Unfor <laughs> unfortunately, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if it's a link to your website, then would that be okay? Or if your website has information that is essentially commercial and promoting either offering for sale or lease or doing any of those things that we talked about previously of a business, then if it's linking through to your website, potentially it falls within the the purview of commercial electronic message. Okay. Um, and then the other one would be. Uh, just generally, how would this apply to PR pitching? So if you do product PR pitches to media, does that count as a commercial electronic message or if the purpose of that message is to get coverage? So any message you're sending out that is of a commercial nature, regardless of an expectation of profit, that meets one of the things that Karen's described, you're promoting a good or service, um, you're selling a good or services, 
that falls within the legislation. So this is fundamentally going to change the way that we're, Canadians are able to do their promotions, their advertising, their outreach. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, it's caught, it's caught on the legislation. So would it be up to then, I know that they're doing their own investigations, but for media to report and call out PR agencies that are doing work or? Yeah, basically. Uh -huh. It would be somebody receiving an email, um, realizing perhaps it's not compliant with the law, and then um, contacting the spam reporting center then to file a complaint. Okay, I think we have time for, do two we have more. two more messages, or yeah. two more questions? Yeah, we'll take uh, those two and then I think we're out of time. I've got two, they're relatively brief, but they're related in that they relate to the scope of communications once you open the pipe. Um, first one is the stack of business cards. It seems to be a favorite topic of everybody's. I know that um, whenever salespeople come back from a conference, it's a stack of business cards, and the first thing they do is go spam like crazy. This is what we do, this is like, thanks for inquiring. You didn't ask me this question, but my God, I can have all these other solutions for you, right? What can they send as a first email that would open up the scope? Uh, would it be, um, let, tell me more about your company, because I can ask that question, um, and please consent to me telling you more about my company. Oh, what, 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 what advice would you be giving your clients to? That's potentially on, one approach. And again, yeah. that email that you are sending has to relate to their affairs, and you've got to be very careful how you're you wording that know anything, so though. that you don't, you don't come off offside with the legislation. Right. Um, you know, the best advice, I think, is just, and this is what I think our government wants, is you pick up the phone and you call them. We met at this conference and, you know, like to discuss. Um, but I agree that on your first instance of contact, you should, you know, I'd like consent. And we talked earlier about when you have, if you, if you can rely on an applied consent, which the business card exemption, we call it the business card exemption, is an applied consent, yeah. but you want to turn that into an express consent as soon as you can. And so it, I agree with you that in an email putting, um, you know, if you agree to receive commercial electronic messages from me, please click here and then, you know, have that link perhaps to a, a website where they can fill out a form with their contact information. I agree to receive these or have them email you back and, you know, give their express consent. So these are my words, not yours. It would be cut to the chase as quickly as you can and get express consent, even if you do go an inch off over the line to do it, perhaps, right? I can't, I can't, Don't I can't, can't, can't comment. <laughs> Um, the other question is also kind of so scope again, right? Um, when you receive an inquiry, a complaint, or a request of some kind from someone you haven't met before, who knows, maybe someone in an organization you may be communicating with, but not them in particular, someone from service or someone from another department. Um, is your scope of communications limited to that complaint or request, or does that open up a broader scope where you can communicate to them for the next two years, it's now a business relationship, anything goes? To, from your knowledge of the act, from just, yeah. So yeah. your question, is sorry, if you get just trying to rephrase it, is your question about if you've emailed with one person in the organization, you want to email with somebody else? No, if you re in the the exemption you relate, you mentioned earlier, where a complaint comes in, yes, a request comes in, yes, or an inquiry, yes, right? That opens up a one way street, but what's the width of the street on the way back? Can you can only res you can only respond to that complaint. You can't then okay. make a pitch to promote your goods or services, so, or so it doesn't open the door. It doesn't broaden no, the, scope. the exemption is very narrow. The exemption is the right to reply to a message you've received in relation to an inquiry, an application, a complaint. Yeah. But it doesn't open the door to then be able to promote um, one's commercial activities. I get the feeling you've read the act. Okay, <laughs> thanks, million. Thank you. So my, mine is going to be super quick. Um, my present automatic electronic signature includes my telephone and fax number, which no one uses, my email address, and my website. I have to take the website off because if they were to click on that, they would go to something which might be promoting my service. On so, a strict reading of the legislation, yes. On the, on the verbal guidance we've gotten from the regulator, putting possibly not your either. website, it possibly would not. On a strict reading of the legislation, yes. But again, these are sort of interpretational gray areas we're waiting for more guidance from the CRTC, which I understand is coming. Uh, we hope it's coming soon, and, and sort of it, we're hoping that it'll address some of these questions that are being raised across Canada in presentations that you know we're giving, that others in the legal community are giving, and so um, a lot of great questions we've had, and um, you know we appreciate you taking the time to learn. It's an amazing with us. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.